Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Sandro Galea, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. On behalf of our school, welcome. Before we begin, a word of thanks to everybody who's joined us today and to every, everybody who made today happen, in particular to Meredith Brown and Alicia Noel. Thank you. Today is part of a series of events we are hosting on the coronavirus. This pandemic is unfolding rapidly, giving little time to reflect. These events are meant to provide such time, helping contextualize the pandemic through the lens of contemporary public health issues. Today, we will look at COVID-19 and politics. While we do not often think about it, our national narrative is indelibly linked with our political conversation. This pandemic has been part of that conversation unfolding on the national political stage. This reflects something I've long felt, that health is politics. Politics shapes our ability to access the resources we need to be healthy. It is also where we turn for coordinated leadership in times of challenge, as recent months have shown. Failures of politics played a role in allowing the virus to spread. Engaged creative politics is what it will take to stop it. We are truly honored to have an outstanding panel with us today to discuss the intersection of politics and COVID-19. Each panelist will speak for about 10 to 12 minutes, and then I shall do my best to moderate questions from the audience. Please feel free to use the Q&A tab in your Zoom browser, and I will try to get it to as many questions as we can. I will keep the introductions very brief, just so that we can hear more from the speakers more. Our first speaker is Eduardo Gomez, Associate Professor at the College of Health at Lehigh University. Professor Gomez. Thank you very much, Dean Gelli, and thank you all for joining uh, the conversation this afternoon and for taking the time. I'm delighted to see so much interest uh, in addressing politics of uh, coronavirus. I agree with Dean Gali, this is a critical time for us to be addressing this issue on how politics has played a factor in that government's response to the uh, epidemic. As a political scientist, I'm very intrigued and concerned about how the US political system and elections is interfering with the government's policy response to COVID-19. The issue as I see it is that the coronavirus has taught us a lot about how politics can gravely interfere with the national government's policy response. The problem has not necessarily been scientific and technological knowledge, we are certainly world leaders in this area, but rather national elections, presidential interests, and the ongoing challenge of federalism. More than ever, we need to take politics seriously and treat politics, unfortunately, as a hindrance to our government's ability to not only respond to healthcare needs, but also address the needs of those that are marginalized and ignored in society, such as immigrants, the poor, and the homeless. In this presentation, I will discuss the biggest concerns that I have uh, about the political process and its interference with our government's response to COVID-19, as well as some poli potential policy solutions. I outline three major concerns. One, political interference and delay in policymaking and implementation. Second, President Trump's personal characteristics and views. Three, the politics of marginalization, political views and treatment towards immigrants, the poor and the homeless. And I'll offer three policy solutions. One, working more closely with the states and the private sector to expand access to testing. Two, thoroughly applying the Defense Production Act across all sectors. And finally, the importance of global health diplomacy and the government working with other countries to learn policy solutions. It is important to note, however, that there have been two phases of COVID-19 politics. Phase one, this is the phase which entailed intensive bipartisan conflict, denial, and conflicting presidential views, especially towards scientific evidence. And this phase mainly occurred in January and February. Phase two has started this month and is marked by consensus building the resurgence of science as an influential policy force. Though one element of bipartisan conflict can still linger, and that is the politics of blame and federalism. In my discussion today, I will focus on phase one because it is here we have learned the biggest lessons about how politics interfered with policy and has made, I would argue, COVID-19 situation a lot more worse than what it should have been. Here are my three concerns. First, political interference. The virus emerged in perhaps the worst time ever amidst a fierce national elections, presidential elections. There was a considerable delay in policy response due to this climate. The Trump administration initially downplayed the seriousness of the virus. Also, Trump began to politicize COVID-19 starting in January. In fact, at a campaign rally, for example, he referred to COVID-19 as a democratic hoax used by the Democrats to undermine his administration's electoral prospects. 
Instead, Trump argued that the virus was under control and that his containment policies and travel ban policies were working. On the other hand, Democrats and scientists emphasize the importance of a timely response. They emphasize immediate testing and social distancing to flatten the curve and to reduce the impact on our health system. Analysts claim that a great deal of time was lost in preparing COVID-19 and testing the public due to these conflicting political and policy views, which are influenced by these electoral politics. Major policies are also delayed. For example, the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, which was finally passed on March 18th, was delayed by nearly a week due to debates within the House. Democrats pushed uh, uh, to provide greater compensation, and introduce other benefits such as extending SNAP benefits, which is important for low-income families and children staying home from work. Trump and some Republican leaders complained that Democrats were sneaking in too many entitlements and they were creating a huge bureaucracy. Finally, an agreement was reached about extensive, after extensive haggling between Senator uh, or Speaker Pelosi and Trump, but this program took longer than what it did, should have due to partisan politics. Another challenge has been Trump's personal characteristics. Political scientists for many years, political science discipline, has always looked at the psychology of political leaders. And my view builds on Professor James Verona and David Blumenthal's book, The Heart of Power, and, and where they argue that US healthcare politics and policy is shaped greatly by the personal interests and experience of presidents. In that light, two of Trump's personal characteristics stand out to me as contributing to delays and consensus building during the first phase. The first one is holding grudges. Trump never forgets those who have offended him. And this seems to have hampered his relationship with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, which some of analysts have claimed has led to him missing meetings with the Speaker over particular, on, on these policy issues. And second, sticking to his own beliefs. As we have seen in numerous other instances, President Trump has always you know, stand by his personal beliefs on scientific matters, no matter what the science says. For example, we saw this with the timing of a potential vaccine uh, at a, uh, conference at the White House, and at one point, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Fochi correcting him on the timing of the vaccine, as well as Trump's denial of WHO's projected death rate from the coronavirus. These personal characteristics contributed to the federal government's delay in February and taking the virus seriously and the importance of testing. But another issue is politics of marginalization. This is something Dean Gallia has worked on in his work and we're working together on an article. Here, the Trump administration has been consistently committed since the beginning to tackling illegal immigration. In the process, however, this has added to social marginalization of immigrants with several consequences. First, immigrants may be afraid of reaching out to local hospitals to obtain care that they need. If they have symptoms, they may be afraid of going to hospitals due to their particular immigration status, despite being reassured by the government that that would not be an issue. There's still an element of trust and trusting the government uh, to go to hospitals. This virus consequently could continue to spread within isolated communities and immigrant communities, but how will the government, both state and federal, reach out to these immigrant families? Since most families have now left IC, IC, ICE detention centers and are staying within their sponsored homes, how will local healthcare providers locate and work with these families? What is treatment going to be look like for these recent immigrants crossing the border and being held in ICE detention centers? Should we release these individuals from detention centers in a time of public health crisis is an issue that we need to address. Finally, there needs to be a stronger policy response in helping, helping the homeless and providing assistance. Some cities have started to address this by allocating space in parking lots to help the homeless, but something that has not been focused in in policy discussions. But there are some potential policy levers that we can use and, and, and solutions. The first is that the federal government can certainly work more closely and effectively with the states in expanding testing centers. And one proposal and one agreement has been to provide uh, drive-through testing centers and collaborating with the private sector to do so, such as companies such as Walgreens, Rite Aid, and Walmart have agreed to work with the government in creating these testing centers. But to date, only about five has been, have been open and there's a long delay in opening these centers, but there is some potential in doing that. The second is applying the National Defense Production Act uh, to all health sectors. Instead of focusing only on ventilators, what the Trump administration has done in working with GM, uh, the government can expand this to other areas, and critically, for example, in, in producing masks and other protective equipment for frontline healthcare workers in hospitals and local communities. 
And finally, another policy issue, it, uh, solution could be extending global health diplomacy, deepening global health diplomacy. Trump needs to start working more closely with China and other nations and learning about policy innovations and how they can more quickly respond, efficiently respond to local needs. It's very good that Trump has been reaching out to China and, and, and establishing a dialogue. And I was happy to see yesterday that Russia has provided medical supplies to New York area, sending over a plane with medical supplies. And I think that this is good promising work and that more international collaborative effort needs to be done in handling this pandemic within the US. Let me conclude by saying that there is some good news. It seems the dilemma of bipartisanship is decreasing to some extent. <clears throat> extent. There appears to, appears to be bipartisan consensus on the urgency to respond, um, but there's still some challenges. Federalism and the politics of blame is still an ongoing problem. Uh, the Trump administration continues to blame governors, particularly from Democratic states, for having a delayed response. And I think that this is an issue that needs to be avoided. However, scientists appear to be having more of an influence now. The data that was recently released on the projected number of deaths in the country seems to have convinced Trump that uh, the administration needs or the, government, the society needs to extend the social distancing until April 30th. So that are some good signs of, of science resurging in the second phase, as I mentioned earlier, to positively influence policy. More than never, Republicans are now realizing that the need to work with Democrats in, in, in creating effective policies in a timely manner has certainly arrived and is increasing. And I think uh, although we had a troubling, very rocky road at the beginning in phase one with political situation, uh, it seems that bipartisan conflict is somewhat decreasing despite the federalism challenge and that we are realizing that politics was a hindrance at the beginning and that can be overcome over time. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Professor Gomez. The next speaker is Jennifer Grotsky, Vice President for Federal Relations at Boston University. Jennifer. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you to Dean Galea and the BU School of Public Health for inviting me today. I wanted to start with a story uh, of a time a long time ago on Capitol Hill, and that was Tuesday, March 10th. Uh, I am a registered lobbyist, and I spend my time uh, working with congressional offices on Capitol Hill talking about what BU students, faculty, and staff need from the federal government and how we contribute to the national good. March is my busy season. Um, so you may think that March Madness refers to college basketball, not for lobbyists. Uh, for us, it refers to the deluge of fly-ins by advocates from around the country who travel to Washington to speak with their members of Congress. Um, there's the dairy farmers of America, the community pharmacists, cancer research advocates, the American Bankers Association. You get the idea. So as coronavirus spread around the world and then the United States in March, I saw scientific societies and my own university starting to cancel large gatherings. So I waited for the next fly-in day on my calendar to get canceled. Uh, and that was Humanities Advocacy Day. Uh, the annual trek of humanists from universities, museums, and cultural centers to Capitol Hill to urge Congress to increase the budget of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, but it turns out the humanists were undaunted. Uh, so Humanities Advocacy Day was a go on March 10th, and I joined hundreds of advocates on Capitol Hill for a full day of meetings with legislators and staff. And I expected the halls of Congress to be quiet. After all, the virus's impact in Washington state was already on everyone's mind. The first coronavirus relief package had already been signed into law five days earlier. That was the Coronavirus Preparedness and Response Supplemental Appropriations Act, uh, a mere 13 pages. It added about six and a half billion dollars to the Health and Human Services budget, including 2.2 billion for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. But it turns out I was wrong about Capitol Hill. Uh, it was not quiet. The congressional buildings were packed with people from all over the country, squeezed into elevators, clogging up the cafeterias. So a, you know, a handful of congressional offices had posted bows and toes signs on their doors indicating that they would no longer be shaking hands, just tapping elbows uh, and toes in greeting instead. Um, and of course, most offices had seemingly doubled up on their hand sanitizer. So the idea of so many people gathered in such a small space is shocking to me now, uh, but at the time it was business as usual on Capitol Hill. That was Tuesday, March 10th. One week later, the second coronavirus relief bill was signed into law. 
the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which we just heard about. Now that was 40 pages long, and it included a brand new federal mandate for paid sick leave, expanded food assistance and unemployment benefits, and healthcare coverage for coronavirus testing. By the time that second bill was signed into law, the Capitol was already closed to outsiders, and all business was taking place over the phone and email. And here we are today, barely three weeks later, with the third coronavirus response legislation, the largest stimulus bill in the history of the United States signed into law last week. The 335 page CARES Act will cost more than $2 trillion, which is 10% of the nation's gross domestic product. It includes billions of dollars in stabilization funds for hospitals, community health centers, and others, and was put together and passed in record time. Before it was even done, lawmakers and lobbyists, including me, started gearing up for a fourth bill. So my march went from being uh, incredibly busy to incredibly busy, but in a very different way and via telework. Obviously, these are unprecedented times uh, for the American people and for all sectors of the US economy, and certainly unprecedented for the US Congress. That being said, there are some constants in the way that Washington works. And I wanted to point out a few areas of the politics that I find interesting as someone who spent 20 years working in Washington, first as a Capitol Hill staffer in health policy, and then as a university lobbyist. First, uh, spending money is bipartisan. As much as we think of the Republican Party as the party of fiscal responsibility, and as much as we've seen the Trump administration propose truly dramatic cuts to public health, and other discretionary federal programs, the last few years in Washington have been an absolute spending spree. Uh, Congress has ignored the budget caps that they imposed on themselves just a few years ago in favor of increasing spending on programs ranging from the Department of Defense to the National Endowment for the Arts. So it's not terribly surprising that the money has flowed very quickly for coronavirus response. Yes, the sheer size of the bill in such a short period is mind boggling, but the idea of throwing money at a problem is not new on Capitol Hill. But money isn't everything. And um, I'd say the majority of my lobbying life is focused on budget and appropriations matters. I wanna increase the budget for student aid and for research. And if I do that, I've done my job well. But this crisis is showing us that money is not enough. You need policy, you need planning, and you need leadership. The United States has an Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response at the Department of Health and Human Services, and of course the CDC. Their budgets are billions of dollars, but that money was not enough to slow the impact of the coronavirus. Good decisions by effective leaders who had the ear of the people above them were needed instead. Third, Partisanship is nothing new. Uh, I worked on Capitol Hill on 9-11 and during the anthrax scare. And as much as lawmakers pulled together to quickly write laws in response, including the law that created our current biodefense structure, the process had plenty of partisan bickering and plenty of legislative provisions seemingly unrelated to the matter at hand dropped into must pass bills. The same happened with the third coronavirus relief bill and will inevitably occur with the fourth bill that is being crafted now. And finally, public health needs help on Capitol Hill. Uh, legislators tend to respond reasonably well to medical emergencies. They see opioid use skyrocketing. They send money to the states to turn back the tide. They see New York City firefighters with lung diseases after 9-11. They rush to compensate them. Legislators also respond well to things that personally impact them. A lawmaker whose father has Alzheimer's disease will prioritize that research. A lawmaker whose spouse is a teacher will support pay raises for educators. But legislators struggle to support things that seem routine and unchanging, that have few vocal advocates, and that seemingly won't pose a problem until the distant future. If Congress can avoid a problem by kicking the can down the road, it will. We've seen this with the complete avoidance of real work to address the national debt, for example. Legislators rarely hear from, hear from the public about the need for a robust healthcare surveillance system or a well-trained public health workforce. And public health is frequently about proper planning to prevent things that are distant possibilities with a fair amount of uncertainty about the payoff. As a result, public health can get ignored until there's an emergency. And as you know, a stop-start funding model doesn't really work in public health. 
So while I think this crisis has certainly elevated the concept of public health for public policymakers, epidemiologists are now national heroes, um, it will take a concerted effort to keep public health top of mind once the crisis has passed. And so that's my final message for folks who are watching today. If public health matters to you, please say so regularly to your friends and your family, your neighbors, journalists, lawmakers at every level of government. Voting is of course a necessary part of our civic responsibility, but it is not sufficient. Robert Rabin, a well-known lobbyist in Washington, DC, says it best about the rapid and robust congressional response to this crisis. The overarching lesson for us is that anything is possible in politics and policy. Things go from never to now. So let's heed Robert's message. Let's decide what policies we want to go from never to now, and let's start working on them. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. I think the phrase uh, public health needs help on Capitol Hill is going to stay with me. Thank you. Um, and uh, I am uh, I'm really honored that you are there to help public health on Capitol Hill. Thank you. Next up, um, uh, Professor David Jones, a Professor in Health Law Policy and Management at Boston University School of Public Health. David. Great. Thank you so much, Dean Galea, for the chance to be part of this wonderful panel. Um, I'm going to start by um, sharing that I, I spent the last few years um, visiting the Mississippi Delta a lot. Um, working on a book there about the social determinants of health, really trying to understand um, all the factors that come together to shape health equity. Um, and what I've constantly had in mind throughout this crisis is thinking about the people I've met down there um, and the gaps that they have um, in sort of day-to-day -day living of food insecurity, housing insecurity, um, and jobs and education opportunities and so forth. Um, and what's clear to me is, as, as Wardo talked about, the different phases of this, pro this, this crisis as it's unfolded, is we're in this very acute phase right now, um, but it's gonna, this crisis is going to be with us for a very long time. Um, and what's clear, I think, as I think about these, these families and these people that I've gotten to know, um, is that the people who are most vulnerable to begin with are going to feel the effects of this moment uh, more deeply and longer than others. Um, and so as we've talked about so far, I think it's very important for us to be thinking about not just the policies that are needed in this crisis moment, but how to think about going forward and creating a safer, healthier, more equitable um, life for everyone, opportunities for everyone. Um, and so I've been asking myself in the politics of this moment, is that more likely now going forward? I mean, something has fundamentally changed um, in some ways, right? I don't think our country is ever going to quite be the same, uh, but does that necessarily mean that all of these policies that um, public health has been talking about for so many years are more likely? Is the healthcare system fundamentally going to be changed as a result of this? Pay family leave is not just a stopgap measure, but as a long-term measure, is that more likely? Um, and I have two categories of responses that I'm going to give to that question. Um, but I want to begin with just a moment of humility as a social scientist here that I have no idea how this is going to play out. Um, that this is just, you know, fundamentally different than anything that we've experienced as a country. It's similar to some things um, and there's theory we can point to and there's history we can point to. Um, but I don't know how this is going to go. Right. So we're trying to learn and, and reflect as we go. Um, and so I'm very grateful for this opportunity to reflect together. Um, the first sort of set of responses and thinking about are these policies more likely going forward as they're up for grabs, it really matters who's in charge, who are the leaders. Um, and so as we think about the election that we're about to have in November um, and shaping who's going to be in charge going forward, um, I want to echo what um, has been said already, Jennifer in particular, that um, you know, who's in Congress is going to shape what happens at the national level. Um, but we should not expect things to be fundamentally different, the politics of these policies, um, that it's one thing to give out stimulus checks or to do short-term family paid um, leave, but that the restructuring the status quo on a fundamental level is much harder. Um, and so, you know, I don't think, we're kind of regardless of what happens in Congress, I don't think we should look at the stimulus bills that have passed as an example of saying that these policies are that much more likely. Medicare for all is not um, going to happen sort of regardless. Um, the pro what, what does all this mean for the presidential election, I think, is an important question. 
Um, and one of the, the first points to make is that this clearly has fundamentally reshaped President Trump's strategy, right? His campaign strategy was going to be the economy is booming, unemployment is low, the stock market is high, um, and all of that has changed overnight. Um, and so he has shifted to a strategy now where he is describing himself as a wartime president. He's a president in wartime. Um, and I think he's right. I think fundamentally that is how history should judge the Trump presidency at this point. Um, but, you know, from my point of view, it's unlikely that he's going to get the um, wartime bump that some previous presidents have received because um, he's not entirely acting like a wartime president. Um, he's not unifying the country. Um, if this is a war, then we can look back three or four weeks ago when he called this whole thing a hoax. Um, and it really wasn't until Tucker Carlson uh, went on Fox News and said the Trump administration isn't taking this seriously enough that he began to shift his uh, tone a little bit. One of the challenges of thinking about this as a wartime presidency is that we're in a war without a clear enemy, right? There's, you know, the, the rally around the flag effect um, that we saw in after 9-11 where President Trump's approval rating, or excuse me, President Bush's approval rating went up to 90%, um, had a bit of an us versus them dynamic as well. And it's not clear in this case who the them is. Um, and I think Trump is trying to fill that vacuum by creating enemies in some ways, um, which tends to be his natural inclination as we heard Eduardo talk about personality. Um, and so calling it the Chinese virus, um, really picking fights, with the Democratic governors of battleground states, really thinking that that's um, the way to, to win this war. Um, so that's, that's one side. Looking at the other side of the presidential race, Joe Biden is having an interesting moment. Um, and I wanna sort of just reflect on how important the timing here was for the Democratic primary, um, where if this had happened, all the shutdowns and everything had happened a month earlier before Super Tuesday, um, it would have been that much more chaotic. We would really have multiple Democrats still in the race. The question about what's Mike Bloomberg, his effect in the race going to be. Um, and so it's actually been pretty important that the race is almost just put to the side for a while. Um, and we're not thinking a lot about um, the election in quite the same way, um, which would be a challenge for a Democratic nominee at this point, except for I think Joe Biden has, has a clearly established brand, has name recognition, um, that he can emerge from this um, clearly um, and, get, and get the attention that a Democratic nominee would feel he needs. Um, and it's also probably not the worst thing in the world for him to change the narrative um, from being error prone, misspeaking, losing his temper on the campaign trail. Um, so if we were to take stock on where the presidential race is right now, um, I think Joe Biden seems to be up in national polls. Um, by eight or so points, depending on the poll. But um, I want to just emphasize that national numbers don't matter, right? We have state elections, not a national election, um, and that Donald Trump could absolutely still win this. Um, and it's really only six or so states that matter. Um, and so how the people in those states understand this moment uh, will be enormously important in the presidential election, which leads to my second um, set of points. Um, which is that we live in a set, we live in separate Americas, right? There are um, three sides three sides to what I mean by this. One is um, the geography of the virus and the, just the geographic uh, way this has played out, um, meaning that even though the virus doesn't know borders, right, and the vi the virus does not respect or differentiate by political ideology we have segregated ourselves so that we surround ourselves by people who think and vote like us. Um, and so we're getting sources of information um, that are the same as everyone around us. Um, and so the, for a lot of people, my relatives and friends uh, who are largely in Arizona or Idaho, um, the virus is seen as something that's happening in liberal urban cities, San Francisco, Seattle, um, New York. Um, and we're gonna enter a new phase kind of right around now where the virus is hitting rural America. Um, and that's gonna, that's gonna change the dynamic a little bit in terms of the politics of it. Um, the second facet of what I mean by we live in separate Americas is, as I started to say, we live in, we are exposed to different facts. Um, and I won't say much more about this other than to encourage um, you to read the reporting by McKay Coppins 
um, at the Atlantic who, as an experiment, opened a new Facebook account and only followed things that were aligned with President Trump. And his Facebook feed was just completely different. And his sense of reality um, was skewed based, based on which of those social media feeds he was following. Um, and then the third and final point uh, that I'll make here is um, that there's a lot of political science research behind the idea of confirmation bias and motivated reasoning, such that even if you expose someone to facts, to alternative facts, um, joke intended maybe, um, to a set of facts that go against their preconceived notion, it will actually just reinforce what they already believe. They will discredit the source and they will believe more deeply what they already believe, even though the, the fact or the evidence um, goes against that. Um, and so um, along those lines, Donald Trump is, he's able to shift in a remarkable way that seems kind of, you know, the dissonance between calling it a hoax and calling this a crisis and mobilizing and taking credit for leading the country through crisis um, seems, you know, too big a stretch for me, but um, the confirmation bias and motivated reasoning dynamics um, at play are that people look to him as a source of information, they trust him, and they will follow him. Um, and um, yeah, so confirmation bias is, is important, um, and we got to appreciate that we're divided, but we need to try to speak across that divide and not just expect that as public health more information long term is going to convince people. Um, because the further we get away from this acute phase, the more likely it is that the long standing ideological differences about the role of government and the role of deservingness are going to um, be the dominant factors in thinking about what policies should in place, uh, should be put in place. So the last, the last point I'll say is as a field public health I think we have largely risen to this challenge that we have right now, um, but we need to do that long-term and we really need to assert a place that isn't just the epidemiolo epidemiology of the moment, but that's really about asserting our role in long-term sustained budgets. Um, and I think that requires people within the field of public health to be more comfortable with politics um, and including get out and run for office to serve on your, at the local level and the state level um, in particular. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, David. Um, uh, next up, we have uh, Professor Daniel Dawes. Um, professor Dawes is director of the Satcher Health Leadership Institute, a professor at the Morehouse School of Medicine, and author of the recent excellent book, The Political Determinants of Health. After uh, Professor Dawes speaks, we'll be doing Q&A. I would encourage anyone from the audience to ask questions through the Q&A button at the bottom so that we can sort them <clears throat> more easily. Professor Dawes, Daniel. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much, Dr. Galea, for that very kind introduction. I'm humbled to join this remarkable panel and discuss a crisis within a crisis that too few policymakers and leaders have been raising. And that's the issue of health inequities during this pandemic. You see, underlying the larger movement in this country to increase access to health services, improve the quality of care and treatments has been another movement to advance health equity for all groups, as you heard David mentioning. What we have is the perfect storm for a disaster, a serious health crisis, an inequitable method of health delivery, millions of uninsured and underinsured people, an uneven and politically charged approach to dealing with the pandemic, an upcoming election, and some of the most vulnerable people on the front lines of our country. All of these things leave us vulnerable, and they shine a huge spotlight on the gaps and shortfalls in all of our systems as well as the resulting inequities by our most underserved, under-resourced, and marginalized groups. COVID-19 does not discriminate, but our current economic and social policies do. The pain that COVID-19 inflicts is non-discriminatory, and so our remedies have to be as well. As we work to combat the pandemic, we must ensure that all population groups are given a fair opportunity to weather this storm and reach their full potential. So there are five challenges. I've been asked to talk about challenges and opportunities. I've identified five that I wanted to talk about. The first is that the historical context matters, right? Coronavirus, much like many pandemics, negatively impacts and further disadvantages lower socioeconomic status communities, racial and ethnic minorities, people with disabilities, and immigrant communities the worst. 
Review of studies have shown in this country and other countries when pandemics, natural disasters, wars, and other crises are reviewed post-event, these disparate groups are impacted more than other population groups. And when it comes to pandemics, we have not been successful in advancing equitable policies during these times. When you couple this fact with the declaration that was made by the Institute of Medicine almost 40 years ago, stating although a full commitment to equality has never characterized American health policy, serious questions arise whether the present partial commitments to equality in healthcare will be maintained. It's a sobering reminder of the challenges that lay before us to protect and ensure equitable opportunities for all groups. The other challenge I wanna mention is this idea of federalism and confederalism, right? Which is still an issue today. And I know Eduardo touched upon it quickly. One of the challenges that we're dealing with is the regression in terms of government responsibility over pandemic responses and best practices. State and local governments were charged with handling this, but the burden was too much to bear, and these governments realized that a hodgepodge approach was not effective in the late 1800s to the early 1900s. So what did they do? They deferred to the federal government to tackle these issues across the board. Now we see a regression of sorts happening between federal and state governments and state and local governments. What we are seeing is a very unfortunate blame game. Equally concerning, however, is the regression of health equity focused policies at the federal level, which will likely intensify the disparities experienced by people of color, lower socioeconomic status individuals, people with disabilities, LGBTQ individuals and immigrants, among others. And let us not forget the human beings who are incarcerated. We know, and this is my third challenge, we know that the underlying factors, such as asthma, heart disease, hypertension, lung disease, cancer, HIV, AIDS, disability, diabetes, and obesity, strike disproportionately within communities of color. And as a result, they are at greater risk for complications from COVID-19. The inequities that predate COVID-19 did not suddenly become inapplicable which could result in the US ending up with major disparities in who dies from coronavirus. Minorities and other vulnerable communities still contend with neighborhoods that are largely devoid of necessary health protective resources. And they still contend with political determinants or drivers that created, perpetuated, and exacerbated these health inequities. The lower a person's socioeconomic status, the more limited their resources and ability to access essential goods and services, and the greater their chance of suffering from premature death. Existing inequities in health outcomes and healthcare access may mean that the nation's response to preventing and mitigating its harms will not be felt equally in every community. As local and state governments implement restrictions on personal liberty in some of the hardest hit areas by COVID-19, the potential for discriminatory enforcement and police escalation may endanger the safety and civil rights of at-risk and traditionally marginalized populations. Why is this happening? The social determinants of health play an outsized role uh, in these human-made pre-existing inequities, but underlying each one is a political determinant that we can no longer ignore. The next challenge I want to talk about is the stigma, the distrust and discrimination within these vulnerable communities. We have a history of racism, discrimina discrimination and marginalization, which has left many communities of color distrustful of the medical system, making them less likely to seek out timely care. And minority communities are particularly susceptible to falling prey to myths and misinformation during these situations. A case in point, as we have been speaking with African-American leaders across the country, Many of them, and you may have heard of some of the news stories, there are many African Americans who believed that initially they did not, um, they could not fall prey to this uh, COVID-19, that they were immune, that folks in Africa and other communities were not falling prey to this disease. Fortunately, we're trying to get the word out there. In addition to that, we've had communities saying, well, I don't trust this government. I don't trust the government to come in and test me. They might in fact um, inflict me with this disease during uh, the testing. Or if there's a vaccine, they may come in and inflict me with the disease that way. So we've got to spend time educating the communities. 
The other fact that I want to play or want to raise is the unconscious biases that come into play, especially during shortages. When you compound systemic racism that has been in our healthcare system and the extreme shortage of life-saving resources, PPEs, ICU beds, ventilators, who do you think is on the downside of advantage and or opportunities? Who do you think is going to go without when there is a shortage of life-saving resources? History has already shown us who will go without. Perhaps this time around, we can change that outlook. The last piece that I wanna mention, last challenge, is the data challenge. The data that is being collected and reported out simply is not being prioritized and disaggregated by race or ethnicity, socioeconomic status, insurance status, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability status, and other important demographic data. We know what this means. No data, no problem. No problem, no funding. No funding, no national attention. When we get through this, and we will, once we look back and crunch the numbers, the disparities will be appalling, like they have been every time there has been a crisis in the United States. They always are. Again, we have an opportunity to change the outlook. As we were scanning the various uh, websites of state health departments and local health departments, we found no states that reported income or socioeconomic status data or insurance status. And only two states, South Carolina and Virginia, included race and ethnicity data in their daily reporting measures. The majority of states, a little above about 75%, included age and gender in their daily reporting measures. We can do better. Thankfully, five federal lawmakers this week started to sound the alarm. Senators Elizabeth Warren and Representative Ayanna Presley, of course, both from Massachusetts, along with Senator Kamala Harris, Senator Cory Booker, and Congresswoman Robin Kelly of Chicago, sent a letter to Secretary Asar at HHS asking basically for three things, to monitor and address racial disparities in our nation's response to the coronavirus disease. Two, to urge HHS to work with states, localities, and private labs to better collect data on health disparities as we continue to respond to this pandemic. And third, ensure that the data provided by the CDC does include a breakdown of who's been tested by demographics. These lawmakers are pushing efforts to bolster our system's responses to ensure that these marginalized populations are educated on the risk and have equal access to the resources required to fight this pandemic. As Congresswoman Presley has stated, we are flying blind because we are playing catch up when it comes to educating the public about who is at risk. This presents us with a prime opportunity to help ensure a more equitable and inclusive response to the, to the pandemic. And in the last two minutes that I have, let me quickly touch upon some opportunities. So our history has shown some success in times of crisis in bringing about a sea change when it comes to crafting more effective, more equitable and inclusive health policies. Interestingly, as you heard me state earlier, when it comes to pandemics, we have not been successful in advancing equitable policies during those times. But we can take lessons from the success or successes we've realized in other crises to advance more equitable policies today. The recent stimulus bills offer a temporary solution for a long-term systemic problem. The most important thing our lawmakers can do is to take a 360 approach to this issue. Any legislation that's passed needs to employ an equity lens and really take into account social and political determinants of health in order to have meaningful impact and save lives. As the House, as the House moves forward with crafting the fourth stimulus package, as Jennifer was noting, now is the time to work on including robust health equity provisions and address the social determinants of health. Once these policies are implemented, we need to monitor them to ensure they are equally and fairly applied to all groups. The biggest opportunity right now is to shift to addressing the upstream factors because what's happening upstream is eventually going to come downstream and will be sitting promptly at our feet. These decisions or these effects are not felt in a vacuum, so we need to inform ourselves, arm ourselves with the knowledge and engage in tackling 
and addressing the political determinants of health. Thank you so much. Thank you, that was terrific, all four of you. So I'm going to uh, go through, I have a lot of questions. I'm gonna to try to be very quick and I'll try to direct them. My first question, Jennifer, is for you. Um, the question is, to what extent do you think that the current administration's skepticism around uh, expertise and around uh, building in uh, people who are um, deeply aware of uh, the facts within the government, has that affected this current response? Thank you for starting with an easy question. <laughs> always, always. Um, Yes, I have, I have done the thought experiment of what would happen if this was a different administration that had been in charge during this time. Um, yes, I think, I think people matter. I said money matters and I think people matter. And I think also the fact that a lot of the agencies um, are short staffed. Um, so this administration also believes in a smaller federal government, which means many positions are open right now. I think both those have had an impact uh, for the negative. For us. Um, uh, thank you. Um, Eduardo, a question for you. Can you comment a little bit on um, what are your thoughts about how could the federal government intersect equitably with the states in terms of, dis in terms of distributing needed resources? Yes, yeah, so I think that the federal government needs to get more information on what, which, which uh, from the states and especially the local governments in rural areas, what resources are needed and better tailor intervention and supplies and targeted to those areas. I don't get the sense that there's been an effort by the federal government, at least I haven't seen in the media, of locating you know, rural areas, as David mentioned, uh, areas uh, that are isolated from urban uh, centers and where there will be a greater need going forward. So that's going to entail you know, receiving reliable information from in these areas and over time and actually you know, visits by uh, FEMA or, or other, other public health experts to these areas. Thank you. David, next question is for you. Um, it's a bit of a crystal ball question. We actually have many crystal ball questions, which I like. Um, um, do you think the crisis is going to um, escalate or narrow bipartisan divides? Is it going to escalate the partisan divides? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, again, in humility, I, I don't know. There's so, so many things I couldn't have predicted about where we are now. Um, I, I think I think there's a real hunger for optimism and hope in our country, and there has been since Hope and Change 2008, right? There's just a hunger for optimism and hope. Um, but there's also a lot of fear and anger. Um, and given our political structure, the federalism, as we've talked about, the blame shifting and the credit claiming, it's just accountability lines in our federal structure are so vague um, that that it's hard to know who to blame. It's just easier to be angry. Um, and given the nature of gerrymandering and so forth, um, the incentives for most leaders are to flame the fan, like to, to, to fan the flames of partisanship. Um, and so I think there's gonna be hunger and there's gonna be moments and a lot of talk about bipartisanship and coming together. Um, but I worry that people are gonna tap into the fear and anger. Thank you. Daniel, um, combining two questions for you. Um, yes. both, both questioners agree with the health equity vision, find it inspiring. One of them is a student and said, what can I as a student do about it? And uh, the other one, similar, said, how on earth do we do anything about this? Mm, God, I know, right? It's, I, I, I feel guilty sometimes when I'm talking to folks because sometimes when I talk, they, they feel as though there's no hope. I think there is hope. I think that um, we have certainly got to educate uh, these policymakers about historically what has happened, sensitize them to these things. I think there are opportunities, uh, whether you are at the local community uh, level or the state or the federal, even though a majority of the state legislatures have um, postponed due to COVID-19. But I think that there are opportunities at every single level to engage these lawmakers, to sensitize them to what is happening um, in communities that may not um, uh, be reflected in their own districts, right? And, and to, to connect the dots to how that might impact the very communities that they, are, they care about, right? So I think that, uh, that is one way of doing this. Thank you, I like the, I like the message of hope actually. Um, um, Eduardo, a question for you, if I may. Um, how, how do we most effectively educate the public? And as a corollary of that, how do we educate the public in a way that will then inform what they do at the polls? I think that we need to inform the public by writing more media articles, uh, you know, maybe as academics, right, starting to write more uh, for the general media, uh, you know, for the Atlantic or for the CNN or for, you know, uh, magazines that are read by the public. 
And I think there's been a lot of studies that show that people tend to read on average, and even scientists, briefer articles. But I think this is the time for us in academia to really provide our insights and to reveal not only through data, but policy opinion uh, about what's going on. And I think that will have a tremendous impact uh, on, on voters and turnout in voters and, and their views about the truth and the science about what uh, is happening in the situation. I agree. Thank you. Um, can, I, can I jump in on that? Yeah, please. Um, so I, I think about this question a lot. Um, and I think, um, so sort of famous theory in political science, John Kingdon's policy windows, the policy change is possible when three things align. There's consensus on what the problem is. There's consensus on what the solution could be. And there, the politics are there. Um, and I think it's clear we're in a moment where the politics are there. Um, and I think the sort of within some liberal bubbles, there's some consensus on what the solutions are. Um, but I don't think there's really consensus nationally about what the problems are in terms of these long-term sustainable, equitable issues that we're talking about. Um, so I think it's really important for public health, for academics to really make a concerted effort to speak across the partisan divide and really to, you know, to go to the news outlets that are the conservative places and where conservative people get their information um, and really try to be a part of that conversation as well. Thank you, David. You actually anticipated a question. There was a, a Kingdon question, which I was going to get okay. to, and you actually answered the question right now. So go. thank you. Um, David, let me ask you one more question. I was going to come to you for this one sure. as well. Can you comment a little bit about um, what states can do most effectively right now, uh, given number of people who are losing their jobs and as a result, losing their health insurance? Yeah, I mean, so, just again to emphasize the point that we're seeing a shift in how this is playing out where it's really coming to the rural south now and so what this the politics of this the the policy dynamics um, are really changing I mean, so the georgia governor today if i understand correctly um shut down schools for the rest of the school year shut, shut down all non-essential businesses um with a kind of bizarre statement that the evidence behind this is that now we know um, that people who are not symptomatic um, are able to carry the disease. And now that we've learned this, we need to act quickly. Um, which, anyway, I'll leave that aside. I mean, what can states do? Um, it's a hard question. I, I, I think in the really long-term, I'll take the long-term view. Um, I think addressing the political determinants of health that Daniel so eloquently talked about, um, and really focusing on voting rights. Um, so I would sort of always be thinking about gerrymandering and access to voting and who gets to have a say. Mm -hmm. that's, where, that's where my mind goes long-term. Thank you. Um, Jennifer, I can ask you a couple of questions um, combining them from people. Um, they're both students. Um, so you know, as a student, I, uh, people uh, were quite taken by your comments. So what, what can we do? And I'll take the we as students and citizens to prevent such chaos from happening again next time this happens. So on the political side, I think um, the best thing that you can do is sort of be in the Rolodex of your local elected officials, right? So come to their meetings, their public events, meet with their staff, tell them about your expertise. Um, Eduardo mentioned, you know, write popular opinion pieces so they know who you are. <laughs> Introduce yourself before there's a crisis. Start local because every elected official starts local generally. So Daniel mentioned Congresswoman Presley who worked for congressional office and was a city councilwoman. There are many people, for example, at BU who know her and are informing her work because they've worked with her for years and years. So introduce yourself, get in the Rolodex and be a resource for people so that when there is a crisis, they come to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Daniel. Can I go to um, a question about um, the, the federal government and equity? So, yes. so what are your thoughts about how we can shift the federal government towards a, an equity lens? Well, you know, it, it really depends on a host of factors, right? We know the political wind shifts um, and has done so throughout uh, periods of our nation's history. But once they do shift, uh, we're then able to take advantage and, and create policy in the crucible of politics during that time. So, you know, it may be a little difficult right now. In fact, we, as you heard me mention earlier, uh, under this administration, we have seen a regression in terms of health equity focus policies that were developed on a bipartisan basis from the Reagan administration all the way to the Obama administration. Many of these programs have been under attack. Uh, many of them have been slated for repeal or they're just not um, being enforced anymore. So currently, I don't see it at the federal level happening right now. Uh, what I do think under the right circumstances and how it's worked in the past 
is if you can align that policy agenda, that equity policy agenda, uh, with a commercial interest and a government investment value, then the chances of that policy seeing the light of day um, increase substantially. So once folks understand the levers that have been pushed and pulled under the right circumstances, I, I think would be even more effective moving forward. Thank you. I'm gonna ask one last question for all the panelists and I'm combining a couple of questions from uh, um, um, attendees. And the question is, um, okay, we're at this moment in time and it is a sad moment in time. It's a moment of deep uncertainty when a lot of people are uh, injured, a lot of people are dying. But how do we capitalize on this as a moment of opportunity? What are the priorities that each of us should be doing to shift the politics such that we actually emerge as positively as possible from this, not only in terms of emerging from this event, but actually to set us up for success after future events. Maybe we'll go around Eduardo. I think what we need to do as citizens is to increase our knowledge more and more about uh, the social consequences, the economic consequences, and seeing the effectiveness of policies. The more knowledge we have, the more uh, we can equip ourselves with press pressuring our legislative representatives and holding them accountable uh, for these issues. I think that's the, the, the one thing that we can do to shift the politics. And I think the election will show, I'm hopeful that, the, that there's more, uh, we, we require more information that uh, it would put more pressure on, on our legislators and the president for address these issues. I think that's what we need to do. Thank you, Jennifer. Folks have to vote. Um, I know a lot of folks who are quite educated and think that voting doesn't matter or don't come out to vote, so vote. Thank you, David. Yeah, so I think long-term, one thing that I hope comes out of this is people have a great appreciation for how wonderful teachers are and how hard a job that is um, and that we have a longer, deeper, sustained investment in educational policy because I think that's just one of the fundamental social determinants of health that's going to create opportunity across all the other dimensions. Thank you. Daniel. Uh, sure. And, and so ditto everything that um, has been stated. I would just add that um, you know, I think that a lot of our networks and our partnerships have been weakened over time. I think uh, many, of us, many of us have become complacent uh, relative to this issue. And so uh, I would advocate for creating um, and strengthening our innovative networks and partnerships, right? that employ an equity lens, that, that include community engagement, that include those who are closest to the pain to truly understand what is happening um, at that level. So then we can uh, help them advance that cause even more so than has been done in the past. What a wonderful panel. Thank you all of you for the privilege of learning from you. Thank you for participating in this and thank you for everything you're doing. I wanna say thank you to uh, all the attendees, those who are on Zoom and those who are on Facebook Live. We will be archiving this on the School of Public Health uh, website and we'll send out a summary um, in a few days. Everybody, thank you for being part of this. Uh, stay well, stay safe. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>